So in general, uh, so what I'd like to just talk about is a little bit about, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, the classification of muscle injury, the, the anatomy, it's going to sort of go into hamstring and uh, quadriceps. I'm probably going to spend most of the time on hamstring injuries, uh, just because I find them the most uh, interesting, uh, but I'll try and keep it as general as possible. So when we talk about classification of muscle injuries, uh, what what kind of like for example, what Alex, what do you what do you use to classify injuries? Uh, muscle injuries, not ligaments. This is 2004. Since I think the British classification system, like MRI. But I mean, you just like oh, if you see a guy a person yeah. in your office. Like grade one. We all use kind of grade one, grade two, grade three. I mean, uh, grade one, you know, we call it maybe a strain or a small tear. Grade two would be an intermediate tear, and grade three would be a complete tear, kind of like ligaments. But, um, you know, these are some of, most of the time people are following, we start to use more MRI to diagnose tears a lot. I mean, ultrasound's a little bit too, but uh, definitely MRI is. No, we don't get MRIs on everybody, but it's nice to be able to use that as classification. And so a lot of people for many years have used the, the last two as a way to grade things. So, um, you know, MRI grade one would be negative or some just some swelling in it in the muscle. Uh, grade two would be tearing, partial tearing. And uh, uh, grade three would be a complete tear. And that's kind of what we use with MRI and when we see a, explain it to a patient, that's kind of always what we've used. But we don't know, a lot of, there's two new, two systems, classification systems that, you know, Neil knows about one and uh, so we're talking about MRI grading. And when we get an MRI of a muscle injury, usually the descriptions are the, the location of it, what muscle obviously is involved, uh, if it's proximal or distal, uh, how much swelling do you see, uh, mostly in the, in the cranial caudal measurement, and the cross-sectional area. There's a lot of studies about how that is predictive. Some of these are predictive of return to play, and uh, you know, there's enough, the same amount of studies that say it's, some of these are very good at it, and other studies that say MRI isn't very useful at determining return to play. So the other two are these, in the last three or four years, that they've tried to develop these muscle injury classifications to help uh, determine really return to play. That's the whole point of classifying them, really, to see if we can get some idea of return to play. And that's really what people are asking us. To. They don't really care if it's a grade one, two, or three. They're going to want to know, OK, well, when can I go back? And so we talk about the first one. So this was. Like you mentioned, I don't think it's only it's not that old. It's it's, it's only a few years old, uh, and it was mostly by the, the British Athletic New Muscle Injury Classification, which is more uh, track and field. And so the five grades they they determined was zero would be MRI negative, just general soreness or neurogenic cause. Uh, grade one would be small muscle injuries, no tendon involvement. And they tried to correlate it with some symptoms you would expect, which would be at 24 hours, they'd have a normal range of motion, strength, but pain with contraction. Uh, grade two would be moderate muscle injuries, possible tendon involvement, specifically the myotendinous junction. Uh, and that would be present as pain during sport requiring removal. And at 24 hours, they'd have pain, weakness, and limited range of motion. And then the Grade three would be extensive muscle tearing, possible partial tendon disruption, and this would be if they felt they could fall down during play. Uh, and they'd obviously have a more extreme presentation, maybe you know, with a limp or on crutches, and a lot more pain and weakness. And then finally, they, they use four as a complete disruption, uh, which is obvious to palpation. You can feel it, you can probably see it, and uh, especially in the rectus femoris. Sometimes see these gaps a lot easier than in hamstrings, and uh, it also could be less painful just because there's nothing holding it. Uh, and then, so they classified it zero to four, and then they subclassify it A, B, or C. So A would be the periphery of the muscle, 
B would be within the muscle belly, and then MTJ is the most common, and then C would be extending into the tendon. So it's much more detailed than we're used to seeing. Um, I actually uh, spoke to the radiologist, Bob Bleakney, the other day about this, and he said, we can do that if you want. <laughs> like, no question. Okay. If you want us to start doing that on the MRIs, no problem. Huh. So it's interesting. This is actually, in the, in, uh, there's nothing wrong with this picture. That was how the, it was so foggy and misty in one of their games. Uh, and again, this is just a diagram of what A, B, and C is. So normal tissue A, you can see the periphery of the muscle. B, more towards the muscle tendon area, and C, within the tendon. And again, this is a lot more detailed. They describe in much more detail than I explained it, but they're, they're talking about more of MRI findings about those things that I mentioned, the percentage of damage, the cross-sectional area of edema, um, and the length of edema, that kind of thing. So uh, you can read that on your own time. Um, and in general, I don't know how many people have seen MRIs with, of muscle. And they, they comment on the, the, the edema comment about how much edema is in the muscle um, as a predictor. To me, to measure edema doesn't, to me it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's just a result of the injury. I don't know, I don't know what you think about that, but to me, if edema is just a result of the injury. It doesn't tell me how bad the injury is in general, I don't think. I mean, if you have a little bit of edema versus a lot, okay, but um, I'm not sure that is good and a good indicator. I don't know if you have any I think it's I think it's probably too early to tell. I think the the more we're using these more uh, the more advanced imaging like MRI, uh, the edema might not mean very much if we're you know uh, the peripheral tissue, and it may mean more if we're talking about tendinous. Right. Yeah. But so I, I don't I don't know at this point. I know. It's just, is. We don't know. So it's it's reported on. It's, it's described, but you know you'd like to know this the quality of the muscle injury if there is any. Right? The edema good. often includes or. It's also a matter of like when you get the imaging, like if you get it sooner, then probably have more edema than if you get it so, sooner. So what do you think is an important time frame for that? There's a good article about that. So when do you think it's when do you think it will change? You know, day one zero, day one versus day one. Like in what range would, would it change maybe the diagnosis? Because they've shown, they did a study that they did a daily MRIs on muscle injuries from day zero to day seven, and no difference. So anybody who says they need an MRI right away to tell if a muscle is torn or anything, it's not going to change. Welcome, Mark. Uh, so these are just a few MRI pictures from the about each each grade. So one B would be. As mentioned, it would be no some a little bit of edema, so you see just a, a trace of edema around the periphery of the muscle. Uh, grade 2A is a more significant injury again, but at the periphery of the muscle. Um, 2B is more towards the, the ten myotendinous junction. 2C is actually within the tendon itself, and that's a that's something you'll get used to seeing with these types of injuries, is the kind of the feathered appearance within the intramuscular tendon injury. And then 3C is extensive tearing, and you see just a more dramatic appearance with some defect here and some waviness of the tendon itself. And then grade 4 is just a complete disruption of the, of the tendon. So this is just a, you know, this is anatomy. Um, they're, they're just showing different levels of what we'd call a moderate tear, which would be damage to the secondary bundle. A mild, a minor partial tear would be damage to the primary bundle or fascicle. Um, this is this leads us into the other classification that's a little bit more complicated. It was based basically basically a consensus statement uh, done in the Munich consensus statement, and this is a busy. The next two slides are really busy, but what it essentially did was divide up functional injuries and structural injuries. And so their functional injuries consisted of, uh, they describe it, one of the guys on this panel, 30 experts, is this guy, this guy out of Germany, Mueller-Wolfhardt, who's uh, 
started Actovigen injections of you know animal calf's blood, but he's so confident in his ability to palpate muscle injuries that he can. Uh, he says he can palpate with a five millimeter muscle injury with his hands only. So some of this stuff is a little bit far fetched, but uh, if you look at one A, they divide it one, two, and then they have the subcategories. But one A would be a fatigue-induced muscle injury, uh, which is a specific area of soreness, and one B would be uh, sort of a general soreness like DOMS, and uh, they describe the symptoms, the, the signs, and the MRI or ultrasound findings, and uh, so that's generally, we probably wouldn't MRI those things or ultrasound them, we probably just base our findings on clinical approach, those obviously get better quite fast, and then you have they describe 2A and 2B, which are, I can't really figure out exactly what they mean by these. One is a spine-related neuromuscular muscle disorder, and one is a muscle-related neuromuscular muscle disorder. <laughs> so it's very complicated, but the first one generally means if they have a spine problem, like a stenosis or neurogenic spine issue, that could account for some of their muscle pain. And the other one I don't really understand, so I'm not really going to explain it. Some feedback loop that they describe. And then they talk about the structural problems, which are 3A, 3B, which are minor, moderate, and 4 is complete. So it's similar to the other one in that way. And then they finally talk about a contusion, which uh, a lot of people, if you haven't seen MRIs on contusions, they look a lot of our very similar to muscle tears. And if you don't give the history to the radiologist, they sometimes can't tell the difference. So it can look like a horrible injury without, and the, the person's still able to play. I know we did, we sent one, we had a player years ago who had a hamstring injury, and uh, we wanted, we got an MRI in his hamstring, and it showed like a, you know, a grade one or a minor, minor injury. But before that, a week before two, he had a, a, a knock or a, Charlie horse or a dead leg, whatever you want to call it, a knee to the quad, and he had a big hematoma, bruising everywhere. And so when they reported, they said, we don't care about the hamstring, you guys better look at the quadricep muscles, like that looks really bad. Because we didn't give the history of that because we weren't even paying attention. But So it can look like a direct, it can look like a torn muscle, it can look like a, even sometimes a complete tear, but the mechanism is totally different. It's not a tension tear. And so they're often able to play with those kind of things. Um, so again, this is how they describe these this Munich consensus. They describe uh, the type 1A. I don't really, I'm not too enamored by this classification system, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Did you did you ever look at that? Uh, no, I reviewed them for the quadriceps last year, and I don't remember coming across the Munich one. Okay, because I thought you sent it to me. <laughs> it's possible it's in Maybe. one ear at the other. Yeah, yeah. So another thing about muscle that have muscle injuries that's that's been a lot of debate is uh, the proximal tendon or free tendon versus the intramuscular tendon. And so, you know, we used to think there wasn't much difference in these tendons that a tendon injury is a tendon injury, but they're actually quite different and uh, some people even, there's some studies to show that the, pro the uh, prognosis of these injuries is worse. And uh, so what, what essentially is the difference, the proximal tendon they now know is a, is a structure that is much more, uh, much more robust, much sturdier, but also more flexible. Uh, it has a lot of different properties than the intramuscular tendon and so uh, injuries to them are much different. The intramuscular tendon it acts more like a muscle. Uh, it has a lot of support from the muscle, and uh, so when you, you tear them, when you tear the tendon up high, you know it just retracts. And if you tear the tendon in the middle, it kind of doesn't act that way because it's got a lot of support. And one of the in the last few years, the intramuscular tendon has got a lot of attention because there was a lot of um, injuries to this area where it looked like a minor injury, they take a few weeks off and they go play and then they pump, pump their muscle. And they're finding that these injuries were actually injuries to the, to the central tendon or intramuscular tendon. Uh, and so for a while it was like, okay, we gotta be really careful about these. You know, if they have this, you know, 
know, it's going to take double the time to recover. We've got to be very conservative in how we monitor them. And then recently, in the last year, uh, they're, they're not so sure it makes a big difference. And the reason why is that uh, a lot of the studies um, for these intramuscular tendons were sprinters. And so sprinters, you know, they can't run at 90%. They can't run at 80%. So for them to be going back, they have to be at 100%. So if the muscle wasn't able to respond at 100%, you know, then they found that it took a lot longer to get better. Whereas if it was a soccer player or another sport, they don't always have to give 100%. They can go at 70, 80. And so they could recover while playing. And so there's now they're, they went one way, like everything else in medicine, they, they went one way about these tendons, and now they're thinking maybe it's just, we gotta take into account the sport, position in the sport and those factors are becoming much much more important so that's that's a little bit of information about that uh, so then we're going to talk a little bit about hamstring injuries so the main the main, two main hamstring injuries that we see are the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus those are really the the main differences semitendinosus semimembranosus and for those of you who don't know uh, there's a this Carl Askling is a, a Swiss a researcher who's done a ton of work on hamstrings, and most of the, the quality research has come from him. Essentially, there's two different types. There's a sprinting type, which um, some people already know this here, most people, which is consistently the biceps femoris tent muscle, and then there's the stretch type, which is consistently the semi membranosus, semi tendinosus, or medial hamstring. And uh, the the biggest difference between those is not only the location, but generally the sprinting injuries, the biceps femoris uh, heal quicker than the stretching injuries. So you see the, the stretching injuries and in, in more like a lot of ballet, it doesn't have to be a, a rapid stretch, it can be a slow progressive stretch and they, they seem to take longer. Uh, and if we look, the attachments, the biceps femoris, uh, there's two actually heads, there's a long head and a short head. And, until I got an MRI telling me about a short head injury of the biceps, I didn't really know that. Uh, <laughs> but most of the problems come from the bicep, the long, the long head, and uh, the semimembranosus is more medial and, and flatter and has a longer uh, tendon attached to it, and then the semitendinosus is also more a medial hamstring muscle, uh, and so. One of the things that we know about hamstring injuries is that, especially the sprinting type, which is much more studied, is that uh, we don't know how to rehab them properly. And the biggest risk of hamstring injuries is a previous hamstring injury, which is not a modifiable risk factor. So it's, if you can prevent the first one, you're going to prevent your risk of getting one. Uh, and so, a lot, of, a lot of rehab protocols have been designed and I want to be able for you guys to, if you see somebody in, your, in the office with a hamstring injury, there may be something you can give them, show them a video and say, hey, you can do these things on your own. You know, start you know, with the help of a therapist rather than, okay, you have a hamstring injury, go to therapy and uh, I'll see you later and hopefully you get better. Which is kind of, does anyone feel comfortable telling anyone about what to do in a hamstring when they have a hamstring injury, an acute hamstring injury? Does anyone give them any advice? I just say don't stretch it, don't, uh, just take it easy, right? So always, I've always wanted to be able to at least tell them something so you feel like you're doing something rather than just diagnosing. Uh, so I'm going to go through this study. This was a, a very good study. It's, it's not the be-all, end-all, but it's, it's a good start. So what, they, what Asking did was did a prospective trial on male and female professional football players with MRI confirmed hamstring injuries. He divided them up into an L protocol, which was a lengthening loading protocol versus a uh, conservative typical protocol at the time. The end point was return to play. And so some of the important things was they were, they were examined within two days of the injury. They had an MRI within five days of the injury. And after they cleared all the normal clinical examinations, they must they had to pass this Askling H test. And I don't have a video of it, but I'll show you that, what the Askling H test is after uh, I show you these, some of these slides. So this is, this is part of the L protocol. And uh, this is called the extender. 
obviously this is very easy for someone to do. And, and the, with all these exercises, there's going to be six I'm going to show you, three for each protocol. None of them are to, to the point of pain. So they have to be pain free. Okay. The next one is the diver. Okay. So you're keeping, you're, you're trying to, the, the um, it should, the, the right leg is the one that's injured. And so you're, it's, a, it's all about eccentrics. And they're really easy, simple exercises to do. And then the third, sorry, the third one is uh, the glider. This is a bit more difficult. You need a little bit of equipment. But what you're doing is you're, you're it's the right leg again that you're, testing and you're going down as low as you can without pain. So this guy's obviously fairly advanced in his rehab because normally at the beginning you're not going to be able to do that. So they started at five days, right after the MRI they started these exercises. Sorry, these are so you're, so you're stretching, stretching type of injury, but it's not true. What type of injury? Any type of these are, injury? These are, these, no, any type. Okay. All comers, sprinting or stretching, but what he's doing is that with the, with the, with the, with the the other leg, uh, the left leg, is once he's there, then he, he's the right leg. He's not using anymore. Once he gets to the bottom, he's pulling up. He's, you're not doing any con concentric strengthening there. Okay, so he's using his arms and the left leg to pull up. The right leg isn't doing anything on the way up. It's just working on the way down. So that's the three from the L protocol, which is the eccentric protocol, and this is the. Uh, this is the conservative, the C protocol. Uh, this is a different person, different injury, as we can tell. They didn't do any kind of transposition or transgender. So it's literally just a, a stretch, and they're contracting a little bit with the stretch, and then you'll see that each time she goes a bit lower. And that's pretty, that's a basic exercise, which used to be a standard for hamstring. The next one is a uh, hamstring extension. Uh, you can go seize the puppies here as well. Does it work? I don't know, it doesn't look like it's a video this time. Anyway, so it's, it's like this. You know, you're just doing this. Let me get my arms right. Like that. So she's pulling, pulling, pulling the yeah, cable so behind Yeah, she's doing her. hip extension. She's pulling yeah. the cable. Okay. Okay. Open kinetic chain exercise. And then the last one is a pelvic tilt. And you'll see it's a progression from double leg. And then she'll do further out double leg and then do a single leg. And they may not do all these in the same, they're trying to show all the different stages as they progress through this. Okay, so you get the idea. Now that the data just in general showed a significant difference for the L protocol. Uh, the sprinting injuries, as I mentioned, were perturbed to play faster. Uh, the proximal free tendon injuries took longer to heal. And at that time, they, they, the MRF findings using edema length, the proximal lesion in terms of its attachment to the ischial tuberosity, increased return to play time. So what they essentially did was they would get them, they would do evaluations every week, clinical evaluations, standard testing, of resistant testing, and when they passed everything, they did this Askling test. So the Askling test is, uh, anyone want to lie on this table here? <laughs> um, I, I don't have a video, but uh, come on, Al, uh, not you, you're a new dad, I don't want you to hurt yourself. <laughs> you, got, you got to breastfeed. And... <laughs> okay, so just lie on the table here, like, on your back. Oh and it's based on, it, on a self self-interpretation. So. What if they have straps and everything, but what they would strap down the uninjured leg, okay, and, and what they would tell them to do is 
who have straight leg Larrys as fast as they can and as comfortable as they can. And, you know, go as hard as you can, right? <laughs> so you do that three times in a row. And you do it pretty f as forcefully as you can. And then you would rate your pain. And if you did it as fast as hard as you can, and you didn't have pain, that you passed, okay? So, because you, what you'll see when people have hamstring injuries, they won't, they won't do that. They'll be very tentative and apprehensive. And so what would happen is if they failed the test, they would go back, rehab for another week, and come back and do the test again. And that happened on quite a few people in the study. I think something like 40% of them. When they pass all the clinical examinations, at the, the routine clinical examinations, and then they did that test, that failed them a number of times. So it's really easy to do. Um, it's a visual, they use the zero to 100 scale. And some, there are some fancy gadgets that they have now which measure velocity, uh, they attach them to the side of the leg. And, and so they can, they can compare it to baseline what they were uh, pre-season and things like that for, for even better accuracy. So based on that, they started doing a lot of eccentric strengthening. And uh, what are, does anyone know of any kind of eccentric strengthening uh, preventative things that you can do with, with people, with teams, with athletes? Is there any exercise that you've heard of? It's really one exercise that if you've heard of it, you'll know it if you Nordic, haven't. Nordic hamstring. Right. So the Nordic hamstring. Does every, who doesn't know what a Nordic hamstring is? You know? Okay. Uh, so a Nordic hamstring is you go on your knees, someone holds your ankles, and you go forward. And when you can't hold it anymore, you just fall down. And there are, there are a number of studies that show that preseason in, in soccer players and uh, other athletes that if you get on a Nordic hamstring program, you're going to uh, reduce the risk of hamstring injuries significantly. But surprisingly, a lot of teams don't do it because there's, there's a lot of people, therapists and trainers that think they they have a better idea of how to rehab people. Um, so this is a, a British Journal of Sport Medicine comparing. So they had two different exercises. This is a nice schema of a, of a little article that was done. Uh, they had two. So this is the Nordic. So they divide them up into three different groups. One was doing nothing, uh, regular activity. One was doing this hip extension exercise, which is more of a puts the hip into more extension than, than the Nordic hamstring. It never goes past neutral here, whereas this one, you can see, does go beyond that. And what they found was that they both worked, uh, and they helped increase eccentric knee flexor strength, uh, but they, they work different muscles. So this, this, because of the added, they think, because of the added hip extension, it isolated more of the long head of the biceps, which is really the one that we think is responsible for the sprinting injuries. Whereas the Nordic hamstring did more of the semi, I think semi, semi tendinosis and the short head of the bicep. So it was an interesting study. It tells us that they both work, but maybe they, they preferentially isolate one muscle versus another. And maybe that, ha that will have some indication about which one is better for what sport or should you do both. Um, so either of those exercises are good, but you know, there's, there's still some more testing to be done or about what would be better in what situation. So again, hamstrings in soccer are, because I do soccer a lot, I'm obviously biased talking a lot about them. There is uh, a lot of work being done about what to do, because they just are they're the highest, biggest injury in soccer. They have the highest recurrence. and They've been tracking hamstring injuries in professional soccer for 15, 20 years, and it it's, has not changed at all. It's not getting any, any better. It's not decreasing, and, and, and the recurrence risks are not decreasing. So they really don't know what to do. Uh, and there's a lot of thoughts about what to do, what not to do. And this is just, to give you an idea, this is like a group of highly trained sport medicine doctors that kind of went through a bunch of return to play criteria, and they kind of went, what criteria should we include, what maybe could be included, and what should be excluded. And without getting into it, into it too much, some of the surprising things are uh, hamstring, uh, MRIs, they don't think you need to, uh, which you know, goes against everything that we do in, in high-level sport. Everyone wants an MRI. 
Um, but you know, some of these are pretty obvious. Absence of pain on palpation, strength and flexibility, absence of pain, functional performance testing, similar hamstring flexibility, uh, and then more performance-based things. Uh, one thing they weren't sure about was similar eccentric hamstring strength e each leg, because you know, not everyone's leg does the same thing in their sport, so they're not sure about that. And as usual, they make a schema that says everyone's important in making the decision. Uh, so it's just, again, these are things that when you get so specific, something as specific as a hamstring injury, there's so much that goes into figuring out what's wrong and nobody really has a good idea of what to do about them. Uh, and again, this is just, again, part of this, there's, you know, you could pick any injury in the middle and, you know, cardiovascular health, emotional health, <laughs> hamstring, muscular, muscle architecture. But it's interesting because, you know, it's, it shows you that for a simple muscle injury, this is all the things that people are thinking about, about what to do about this problem. Uh, can, you, can you go back, sorry, I before you go on, no, not the previous, the one, this one here. Yeah, so what, what about, so, okay, so yeah. they're not, they're saying we might not need to do MRI. What about, like, something like Biodex, in terms of, to, yeah, to so, measure that difference? So, like, similar concentric isometric hamstring strength. Okay. Again, these are, this is like a expert, it's not evident, as much evidence basis as just a group of experts on the topic talking about okay. it. Uh, they're, they're, again, with, Oh, sorry, it's, it's flexibility, similar hamstring flexibility, right, 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 as yeah. opposed to the strength. Yeah. Okay. And so, one of the other things about, the, for three, so there's a few take-home messages about hamstrings that are really important. Uh, and you can apply it to, to other muscles as well, but specifically hamstrings. One is the eccentrics, which we talked about. Two is, uh, it is extremely important if someone is a sprinting athlete, to regularly get them to sprint at maximum capacity. And that means like in the middle, let's say you play one Sunday and Sunday, in the middle of the week, Wednesday, you should be doing very close to 100% sprint uh, to maintain that flexibility, that eccentric strength, because that you can't replace that with any exercise. And so that's something that really has been shown to help prevent injuries, help, and if you don't do it, like if you take a two-week holiday, you're already at risk of, of a hamstring. So that's a really important, and that's often an important part of rehab, is getting them at their highest level of sprinting within 95 to 100 percent of what their maximum sprint, capacity, sprint speed is. Uh, so I forgot the other ones. One of them is eccentrics, one of them is, is sprint, sprint capacity, making sure they're sprinting on a regular basis. And uh, now I've lost my uh, train of thought of it. Um, but, so that's another thing that's really important. Would it have, have to do with load? No, I, th I think it was. More, I think it was. Uh, those two were the most important. The third one wasn't as important. 